Ah, uh, the lament of the man in the well. He's down where the bucket goes, feeling swell. He fills up the cup and he drinks on the trail. And oh, look in his satchel, he's got mail. Mailbag day, mailbag day. Hey, hey, mailbag day, mailbag day, mailbag day. We're gonna break all our creative blockage today. Mailbag day, mailbag day. Hey, hey. Aha, ha, ha, mailbag day. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the mailbag day. Ow, 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 ow. Welcome, my friends, all sentient beings. Just a moment here while I continue to click various buttons. Oh, we're talking about the mailbag day. Hey, somewhere. Huzzah for the generous tipper. Oh, I'm sure that was not an accidental dislike. This stream is awful. There's another dollar. Lee, now you going crazy, man. Thank you. Huzzah for a generous tip. -off. Let's get this underway. We got a big old mailbag with only one question in it today. And we're going to hit it. We're going to hit it like John Henry hitting a, hitting a railroad spike. Wow, nobody talks about John Henry anymore. Whoa! I exist! I emerged from the the nothingness of the interweb. <laughs> quality, quality entertainment here. Greetings, programs. Your old buddy Ingrid Byrne all up here in the northern areas of Rune Hemeria in the uh, village bar home. Fictional character I invented to cloak my own insecurities about transmitting live garbage on the interwebs. Yeah. Ingrid Byrne all here. Today... I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit the big one. This is the mother load of mailbag day right here. And it's not the mother load because we're going to answer lots of different, um, you know, viewer questions and or issues. No, we're going to lump all of a certain one together and we are going to answer it in depth. Did that make any sense? I need to remember how to talk. Each time I come onto the interwebs, I need to remember how to speak in the English language. Very difficult language. Anyway, probably the thing I am the most asked, especially now that we've been getting into the RPG underground, right? Ooh, it's so tasty. We are uh, not only thinking in depth about our own creativity as part of this hobby, not just our own consumer behavior, but our own creativity. And with that, it's uh, sort of rejuvenated the, the comment community here on YouTube. That's been great. And of course, there's always the wackiness on the um, Runehammer Discord channel. But the most frequent piece of mail I get in ye old mailbag is hoping that I could break down some knowledge about creative blockage, mental block, writer's block, as it's also known. But writers don't get to hog this. This totally applies to mathematicians, sculptors, artists, uh, game masters who are creating content for their players. And that is our special focus here is creative block with game mastering. Now, what I'm gonna be breaking down today is just about creative block as a general topic, but really, I truly believe that these solutions and methods, techniques that I'm gonna throw at you perfectly apply to this sort of game master's block. Now, generally there's one little sort of gorilla in the room here, which no method or technique is necessarily going to, to solve. And that can be just your overall level of interest. A lot of times in our hobby, because it is such, it can be such a long-term sort of thing that we do, you know, some of these games go on for years, even decades. If you sort of lose interest in it, Almost nothing I'm going to sort of be coaching you on here is really going to help. You probably just need to take a mountain break. You need to just step away, go fishing for a year. Just focus on fishing as a hobby or Legos or something. Just completely switch gears 
And this is sort of, there's a technique I'm gonna mention which kind of echoes this, but just for your fundamental love of doing what we do, you, you sometimes you just need to get that love back and that's something you just need to be able to see. And so that larger problem, you'll see will wrap itself into some of these techniques that I can help you with. Um, but deep down, down in your soul, creativity comes from enthusiasm and interest. So deep down, you've got to, you've got to be interested and excited about the hobby for any of this stuff to work. Okay, there we go. Whew, man, I am just like, cannot speak. You know, I'm on the interweb here. I'm on the internets and I don't even know how to talk. So thank you everybody for tuning in despite my clumsy verbiage. Um, but really, this is a version of Mailbag Day, which as many of you know, comes from my podcast. I do mailbag kind of stuff. I answer questions and whatnot. But this is like a so frequently asked and with such sincerity and concern from a lot of people who are just like, how do I get past this? Like, eh, I want to have fun and I want to make cool stuff. But I sit down and I'm like in my zone thinking, hey, I'm about to like break some cool stuff off. And then like nothing's happening and I'm grumpy and I just can't. It's not popping out. There's not I look within. There's nothing there. Cobwebs. There's like a little wooden horse in the back of my brain that's rocking slightly. And that's it. Cobwebs. I got nothing. Okay, so with that introduction out of the way, let's get into these methods. These are just like uh, I believe with withdrawing or writing, doing layout, whatever, all of the skills involved in this sort of RPG underground movement I like to think about, all of the skills involved are skills you can work on and learn. I know that drawing, especially people you know, think that there's a lot of talent involved and talent never hurts. Hell, you know, talent's great, but everything can be improved and learned to a degree just by practice and putting in the work and understanding your own creative patterns is no different. It's just a matter of thinking clearly, writing it down, knowing it, believing it, waking up with a dedication to say, I'm doing this. I'm going to go up on this. I'm going to get hot, baby. Shots fired, mofo and hit. It's Battleship B. I smell smoke because I'm on fire. Okay, anyway. Whew. Did IQ, my IQ just like dropped a couple points right there. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Remember, I can't always see your comments when I'm over in Photoshop mode, so you know, you're just going to have to just keep on commenting and I'll come back in a little bit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ingrid Bernal here. That's me. I'm excited to do this uh, this stream too because this is something that that it really strikes close to home for me. I mean, sometimes it gets very weird just working on this stuff day in day out. It starts to feel a little odd. Some days it's like, oh my god, I freaking love this life. It's so fun. I'm so privileged. I'm so lucky. Woo! Other days it is excruciatingly difficult to summon it up and to make it happen. And you know, this is one of the hazards people talk about with hobby jobby. Where, you know, the thing that you love, if you make it into a job, you might wind up hating it. That is a danger. But breaking creative block is something that I have to actively do like three times a freaking week. So if you're going through it, do not feel alone. Do not feel like some kind of chumpy slumpy. You are a normal creative person. As a matter of fact, I would say a good solid case of creative block is the sign that you're actually heading into some cool territory. Because... It's kind of like, um, you know, getting like pulling your shoulder at the gym, right? Maybe you were pushing a little bit too hard. Maybe you're getting a little too swole up. You know what I mean? Like straight yoked and you're just pushing a little hard and you reached a bit of a limit. And so you are knocked down a little bit and nobody likes to be knocked down. But when you get back up, you will be stronger. And the same is true of creative block. Now let's just get in here and do this. Here comes the infinity mode. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Man. Every time we go through that, it's using, as, uh, as my friend Abel Fader would call it, a refurbished transporter beam. Okay, <laughs> it feels a lot like that. All right, break your creative block. Let's get through this stuff. You want to make some things, maybe you have some ideas, but when you start getting down to paper, you're stumped. What do you do? Here's what I suggest. First one, boom, fix versus create. Okay, so. This is a classic uh, technique. I think this is actually sort of, you know, out there in the in the annals of actual methods um, for breaking creative blocks. So I'm not just kind of. I think this one is like pretty legit. <laughs> so you you certainly should listen. All right. The blank page syndrome 
can really cause a lot of blockage. You, you, you see my brush right there? It's like I go to draw right in the middle of this nice piece of paper and I start hesitating. I'm like, ah, ah, what am I doing? Am I doing like a pyramid or am I doing like a, a butterfly with a man's face? Am I doing like a shoe? What am I drawing? What am I doing? And that to me is far more difficult than like this. Okay, so on the left, I've got like a piece of paper with something wrong with it. It looks like maybe I spilled my coffee on there or maybe I was, uh, you know, mucking around with my marker and then I put my hand on my paper and it got all these sort of weird smudges on my paper. Now, part of you, your instinct might be, well, eh, this sheet's kind of wrecked, right? If I draw anything on this sheet, you know, like I start drawing cool little dudes and he's got some crazy hair and he's got like armor. And then I'm like, oh man, I don't want to draw smiley faces. They kind of make a joke out of my stuff. Do like a helmet there and then he's got the... He's got the comb on top and then like start kind of, okay, I'm already getting into something. Well, what am I doing here? Okay, so same thing over here. Let's say that I'm, okay, I start drawing and okay, there's a guy and he's got this thing and there's this thing on top and okay. Now, what's the difference here? Fix versus create. Now, it's generally acknowledged that in mental work of almost all kinds, affecting repair is often much more easy to just dive into than creating ideas. Repairing is a behavior that doesn't ask you to confront the void and hand me something. Repair says there's a bit of a problem and you need to just go, hmm, well, I think I know a thing. I can get an eraser and I can start going, chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk -a hey, I'm starting to fix this. Okay, yeah. Repair also says, well, there's no way to erase this because I got a bunch of ink on my paper. And so like, maybe I'll just sort of here, I'll confine this in a little box. <laughs> there we go. Now my mess is no longer invading my picture. Or maybe repair would be, you know, crossing this out. Maybe repair would be, well, I'll just kind of leave this over here, but I'm going to write my notes like sort of next to it. And I'll actually, maybe I could turn this little smudge into like a circle. And here, I don't want to do this box ID anymore. I'm just scribble that out. Yeah, and where I have this coffee stain, I'm just going to fill it in with ink, and now I have a circle. And I'm going to make it look like I meant to do that with a, with a bullet. It's like a giant bullet point. <laughs> okay, either way, do you see how many little words and how many little statements I get to say and start to just start sort of playing with right away? Because the situation is there, right? It is in some ways a damaged or broken situation, i.e. a page with a stain on it or a mark that I don't want. Over here on this side, we have this blank, pristine and perfect page and it puts this burden on me to go like, okay, well, this guy's going to need legs. All right. And, oh man. Okay. Yeah. And what, what's cool about this guy again? Like what was I, what was I doing? I don't know. I was kind of just, and instantly I start feeling much more like one note emotionally. Now, if you're really used to or really enthusiastic about your drawing, then you're probably used to this feeling of facing a blank area and beginning to draw and giving yourself direction and diving into something. But if you're in the midst of a terrible creative block, that can be really hard to do. And so here's your first technique. Find something you can fix rather than trying to create something. This is a great technique to get you back in the flow. Now, Let's say, let's take a different version of this scenario, okay? This is a game book you already have. You have, you know, I don't know, Black Hack 2E because you're awesome and cool and that book's great, right? And you're reading through Black Hack 2E and then you start, you want to go work on your own game and you're kind of stumped and you're not sure what to do for the adventure on Saturday night and you just got this bad creative block going. What you want to do is fix something from someone else's work. You knew about that page you found in the DCC core book that had that irksome rule or that table that you didn't like. If you're trying to get your juices pumping, if you're trying to get your creative muscle warm so that you can execute, you know, create the adventure for Saturday night, this can be a great technique. So what you do is you go, you find this, this page in one of your game books you already have, and then over here in your journal, you go, okay, well, it had this little header piece. 
it had this. Now, instead of the way they did it, I'm gonna put this, okay, now I'm gonna do it different. I'm gonna do it with these four bullets and these are the rules for using dice to do a hex crawl or whatever. <clears throat> and they're my improved versions. Another way that you can do this, this very same task, is to find art. Now let's say you're more of an artist than less of a designer, okay? Like I spend a lot of my time doing art. And so maybe you're having that sort of artistic block. Go find this picture from something, maybe even from the internet or from a book you already have or from a, a movie or something like that. In this case, it's this handsome young gentleman here. Find that and either right on top of it, obviously Photoshop would be the best tool for it, like right on top of it, fix it. You know, this, this painting of this guy always bugged you because he didn't have shades, he didn't have a rune hammer t-shirt, right? And, and now I'm doing things. I didn't have to create the concept of a guy. He needed more hair. I'm, I'm fixing him rather than creating him. And this type of practice technique is not gonna save you from creative block. Nothing that I'm gonna advise you is gonna truly save you. But what it will do is get you moving. It will get your pen moving. Like already, I gotta say, this is actually kind of fun. It's fun to draw on a guy like this. <laughs> You know, like, let's say then that I'm kind of, okay, I'm kind of done with that one. And I'm going to put him over here. And then I want another one. Look, because <laughs> this is fun. So I'm going to bring it down. Okay, now this guy, he is a cyclops. He's got funny tifas. He's got a tank top on because it's hot out today. And he's got some crazy tattoos, horns. Anyway, now my pen is in motion. I'm starting to feel relaxed. I'm starting to feel that that limbic response of like, hey, you know, I, my drawings are kind of funny. That makes me feel happy when my drawings look funny. Like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm kind of good at this. And that little bit, that little bit of positive hormones in your brain is really useful to you to get your creativity and your positivity moving, okay? So this is the first idea, is try fixing some stuff, either something of yours, maybe go to another project you're working on or something that's like, you know, you knew you wanted to change, go start working on it, or find even other people's work and sort of clone and fix it in your own way as a way to start getting back into things. Fixing is always simpler, more intuitive, and more easy to jump into cold than creating. So you use it as a sort of a stretching before working out. It's like a way to get the mind ready to be creative, okay? That's the first one, fixing versus creating. Second one, this, you guys know me for this one. This is like, for me, is a huge one. Mess, 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 more mess, 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 mess. Just start doing this. So right now I'm looking into my, my live stream camera. See, isn't that eye contact nice? Awkward. Okay, so I'm looking right at you and I'm gonna draw without even really being able to see down here. And I think I'm doing like some kind of a, Looks like another monster type thing. <laughs> I think these are where the teeth is. I can't really see right now. I think this is an eye. And then for whatever reason, I'm gonna put this hand over here. Now you guys know that I'm a big believer in still not looking at it. In just beginning. Oh my God, okay. So I just made a big mess. I wasn't even looking at what I was drawing. <laughs> It's just finger painting. It's just like, have you ever seen like a three-year-old? They just rub their hands in color and then they rub their hands on something. They have no desired outcome. They're just making a mess. Now, this mess is not gonna give you creative satisfaction, but it's going to help you get over what is really, almost literally speaking, just in your head, your creative blockage. Your creative blockage is, see, look, now I'm already doing it. I'm like. Now I'm back to that fix versus create mode, right? Because I have this mess I made and I'm dying to fix it. I don't want to make some crummy drawing. But the key is I drew it with my, without, <clears throat> excuse me, without even looking. I just made a mess and the mess set me in motion. So a lot like create versus fix. This is a technique to set you in motion, not necessarily to fix your creative block. What it does is it gets you going. 
I'm now drawing. I'm now doing something. What is this thing I'm drawing? I have no idea. You guys have probably also heard of the Rorschach test, right? So in the Rorschach test, random shapes are used to check for psychological response because often random shapes can hide you know what what we're seeing by reflecting our sort of our unspoken thoughts right everybody's pretty familiar with ink blots and Rorschach tests right named after the psychologist who would use these tests to reveal nascent desires tendencies or issues in patients this is very similar to the concept of using a mess to get your creative brain going. A mess is something that does not have a desired structure or outcome. There you go, there's my Rorschach. <laughs> it is just chaos. In this case, artistic chaos. You can do it with writing too, by just writing random thoughts as they come into your mind. You're just making a writing mess. Gets your fingers going, gets your brain saying, Man, I, this is terrible, this mess I'm making. I really actually can draw quite good. I mean, a lot better than this thing. I don't even know what this is. And again, you're getting those positive chemicals moving in your brain. And on an even more sort of um, ground level, you could say, well, sometimes a mess becomes something. And you know, this is something that I do in my art as well, is you just go in here and sort of do this. Okay, what? There it is. What is that? Well, right away I start seeing things. This looks like a head to me, so I'm going to stick an eye on there real quick. And then there needs to be some fur. Now, I didn't set out to draw some kind of creature with a, with a horn on the back of its head, but that's what my mess looked like. It looked like a creature with a horn, and so I just used that accidental incident to start playing. And once I'm playing, I'm starting to feel creative again. Got a puffy tail here. And now I could just go on like this for days. And again, you're almost again in that fixing rather than creating type mindset because you're taking a mess, finding a pattern in it or a hidden image and then beginning to repair and improve it. And that's a lot easier sometimes than just coming up with an idea off the top of your dome. <laughs> what is this thing? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no clue, but it makes me smile. It makes me happy. And when I'm happy, I'm more creative. And so I'm starting to get some dividends on breaking my creative block. So if you're having a creative block, just let go of what your target's gonna be and just sit down and make a mess for a while. Just let yourself have a good time and just see what happens. Okay, the next one is fill and soak. I covered this one in a podcast about a year ago, but it really, really is worth talking about. This is your brain. Well, it's actually just a drawing of a brain. Here's the medulla oblongata and the upper part of the spinal cord. Here we have the gyri and the sulci. Okay, so it turns out that when you are actively working on a problem, i.e. gritting your teeth to break a creative block, you use like this much of your brain. This is the conscious part of your brain. It is the part that you're controlling and saying, I'm commanding you right now to work on this creative problem. Well, funny thing about the brain, you have this huge area back here called the pre-conscious. This is a far larger area that in fact actually processes most of the information, ideas, relationships, and other nuances in your life. It is not so much under your willful control. The will is like a teeny little piece right up here. Here's the lizard. This is the lizard brain here. Here's the monkey brain. So this is like the ego here. The pre-conscious brain does not really like to be controlled by the ego. It doesn't respond well to that. It's too big, it's too complex, and it also involves some elements of the subconscious, which we all know generally is defiant of our ego. So. Hankerin, what the hell are you talking about, Mr. Bernal? Like, what, what is this all about? What's fill and soak? Fill and soak is a, a very long time-tested method that you can not only use to break creative block, but to be creative in, in one of your, even your highest states. Okay, so what you do is you follow these two steps. First, here, let's switch to a new color. 
Let's, let's get into some blue. First, you fill. Filling is something you can do with your ego. This is the act of filling up your current attention, maybe over the course of about half an hour, with concepts that are fun for you. Maybe it's browsing images of gunpla kits because you're into Gundam. Maybe it's looking at photographs of turtles. I don't know. But you're going to fill up your conscious brain, the part that you control, with somewhat relevant data to the problem at hand. Maybe looking through another RPG book. Maybe looking at cool Wayne Reynolds art from Paizo online and being like, oh man, this is so cool. It's kind of getting my, this is getting me going a little bit. But here's the hard part. The hard part is not filling. Filling is something we do day in, day out. It's a big part of our hobby. It's the part where you just are reading because you're interested. You're, you know, checking out some new mechanics. You're getting a book that maybe you're not ever going to play, but it doesn't matter. You're just reading it because it's cool. Filling is something we do all the time. But what we don't do enough of, in my opinion, is soaking. Soaking is the word that I use for the next step. And this is a hard one to swallow, but here it comes. Once you're done with the filling stage, walk away from all of it. Walk away from your office, your iPad, your notebook, the whole deal, the whole hobby. Walk away and go do something else, something completely unrelated. You are now in soak mode. Have you ever had this happen where you are trying to think of like, uh, you know, who was that that really attractive, um, you know, woman in Fast Times at Ridgemont High with the red bikini? What was her name? Oh man, she was so cool. Oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. What was it? Was it Jennifer Connelly? No, she's in Labyrinth, dude. You're out of your mind, right? I can't remember. No, I swear. I, she's in this new thing. I just, if I could only remember her name. You keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And then the minute you stop worrying about it, like you're driving home that night and you know, you've left your friend's house, you go, oh my God, it's Phoebe Cates. Everybody's had this happen to them, right? This is because when you stop straining, tasks go back into the pre-conscious brain and are worked on by the part of your brain that you don't directly control. Because the more you flex, the more you squeeze, trying to choke creativity out of your ideas, the less comes out. You begin to constrict it with your will. Only when your will releases completely and you're just like, I, I'm stumped. I'm just stumped. I'm going to, you know, look about the, think about this a couple more minutes here and kind of look at some of this stuff. And that's kind of interesting. And I'm going to go take a walk by the river. <laughs> this is the art or technique of filling and soaking. Get your frontal brain filled up with plenty of like fodder and working material, you know, raw materials for being creative, and then just step away from everything and let that more dormant part of your brain work on the problem. When you're feeling refreshed, come back to it. Or what happens much more often than feeling refreshed is right when you're getting into your walk down by the river, you're like halfway, it pops in your brain, the solution or the, the new creative direction you're going to take. It just pops in. Because remember, this is the part you don't directly control. So you're just like, you know what? I'm really glad I came outside and gave up on that stinking old computer and I'm not working, you know, grinding my teeth over my RPG anymore. And then like, oh, oh my God, I just needed, I'm just going to use the D12s for that. Oh, why, why didn't I see that before? This is why. So you got to practice the art of filling and soaking. Know how to do it. Practice it. Like, and I mean the word practice, like repeat it. You'll get good at it. You'll know when you need to do it the more and more that you usefully use this skill. Okay, next one. Ooh, diagnose. This one's tough. This is what mechanics really get paid for. A lot of people think mechanics get paid to fix things. No, mechanics are mainly paid to diagnose problems. That's the hard part. Repairing, relatively straightforward, but diagnosing, highly difficult. And so this step, this can be a difficult one, but I've got some tips for you. Okay, so here you go. First of all, what do you even mean diagnosing? Well, what I mean by that is diagnose your creative block. Okay, so here's our guy. Oh, look at him. He's so sad because he's got, he, he can't, he doesn't feel really creative today. He's got spectacles. Ears. There we go. He also has like this crazy big mustache. Look at this dude. Yeah. Okay, so creative block is happening for this poor soul. And I am going to add some little trappings here. 
What are these things you ask? Well, you're going to find out in just a second. Okay. Diagnosing your creative block means, and you might need to take notes for this, which might feel a little weird at first, but you'll get used to it. It is the art of identifying why you get blocked. Why you get blocked. You need to find out the combination of circumstances. And I'm telling you, this will surprise you. You will see patterns quite quickly. If you really put some work into diagnosing when you get creatively cooked or useless or less productive and you, and you start tracking it in your notebook, you will start to see patterns very quickly. Now, in this case, for our, uh, our sad friend over here, we have four elements. Actually, let's call it five. We're going to include the mustache. Well, actually, these are the same thing, too. So first we have bugs. Next, we have whiskey. Then we have iPad. And then we have mustache. Now, these are somewhat arbitrary and comical and <laughs> silly ver uh, examples, but I want to just be really literal with you guys here. Find the elements in your life, in your immediate surroundings that are coincident with your creative block. That's a huge word to use here, coincident. So a lot, a lot of times the word coincidence is used in this kind of funny sort of, you know, slapsticky kind of, oh, isn't that coincidence? <laughs> But in this case, we're using it in a really, really literal and specific fashion. This is coincident, meaning happening together. Every time I have a bunch of bug, every time I have creative block, I notice there's a bunch of bugs around. I hate bugs. And when bugs are around, I get this like kind of cortisol going in my brain. And I feel kind of negative and I'm not very creative. Every time I grow my mustache out really big, I wind up like kind of losing momentum on my D&D campaign. I never noticed that before. That's kind of weird, huh? Well, maybe I should just trim the stash down a little bit. <laughs> Whenever I'm drinking whiskey and we're playing and I'm trying to work on, you know, my writing project, I wind up sort of getting real drowsy and dozing off and it just winds up not happening and I get angry and frustrated and I I'm blocked up. Now, these examples are a little silly, right? But I, I just want to bring it out in the open. This diagnosing is the art of finding out what was going on in your life and your immediate space when you had or currently have a blockage. Now, diagnosis does not just include repair. This is just the step of trying to figure it out. You may not have the opportunity to shave your mustache or to get rid of your whiskey or your iPad. You may be stuck with those things. And if they're causing creative blockage, that, that's a complex situation, right? But this step is simply the step of looking for patterns the different times that you have writer's block finding them, documenting them, understanding them, and then, of course, ultimately, controlling, removing, or avoiding them. Now, unfortunately, you might be facing some difficult realizations when you exercise this skill. So it's, uh, it's not really for the faint at heart here. You might find that a vice of yours or something that you really love is causing some creative blockage in your life. You may find that. And that can be a painful thing to realize. So a good example of this might be alcohol or even drugs that you enjoy as a vice and you thought they actually were making you more creative, but then you look and like a week after like a hard drinking session, you actually like don't come up with anything cool. <laughs> now they, this can be hard to realize sometimes because you say, well, but I love to drink on Saturday night, whatever. I don't want to remove that from my life. Okay, well then now you're into a different set of, of thinking. You're into, you know, making some decisions about how what you do might be affecting your creativity. Now, that's a bit of a dark example, right? You could have much simpler ones like, you know, when I'm working long hours, I tend to sort of be cooked when I get home and I'm not that creative. That's a real simple one, right? With a simple solution. Try to, you know, cut it down a little bit. Maybe on Thursdays, I'm going to cut my day a little bit shorter and get home and give myself some more time to decompress so I can be creative. Right? That's a lot more simple. But overall, it's the same behavior. You're taking your creativity seriously enough to look into why it's getting stopped up and then taking action to do better. All right, finally, this is the one that I hinted at at the beginning of the stream. And this is probably the absolutely most effective one, but also the hardest one to just be like, okay, I'm going to do that. 
here is our not so happy person and here is this person over here look at this guy he kind of looks actually quite demented <laughs> okay so this circle over here this blob is the hobby the RPG hobby okay you're inside of here when you're in here especially over long periods of time it can start to feel confining right you're in some ways you can get into a cycle where you take things for granted now taking things for granted as we all know that's a very negative thing right like no one wants to take things for granted in life we all want to be very cognizant thankful and grateful for all of our blessings and all the things we enjoy in life right but sometimes when you get those things on a prolonged basis you forget the feeling of not having it. You're just kind of in there. You're like, yeah, we, we have a great D&D group we play every Friday. But now I want you to put your shoes or put yourself into the shoes of someone who can't find a group or someone whose group broke up because somebody moved away or they, they, they can't get the players for the game that they want or they don't have the time or maybe the people they do like to play with have changed jobs and now like they can't get a session together and they're this person now. This person has the weekly group, is in the zone, can't come up with something to do for next week because it's just like, man, I've made adventures for like a hundred weekends in a row. Like, what am I supposed to do this weekend? Uh, uh, you know, create a block. But this person, they can't find a group. They're just fantasizing about playing. They're like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool to do this sci-fi setting with these Shadowrun guys? And there's like, they got all these cool, like, PS90 machine guns and they go to steal this ancient sword from this dragon overlord down in the deep city and would that be cool oh man I'll tell you what if only I could find a group to play so what's the technique here you ask Ingrid get to the point the technique is to go from being this person to being this person and there's only one way to do it pow it's to step away from what you're freaking doing you need to get out to where you're craving it again. And the best way to get to crave something is to take it out of your reach. Now, let's stick with the alcohol example, right? Because that's something that strikes very close to home for me. I freaking love beer. <laughs> I love it. But I'll tell you how you can really turn up the volume on loving a nice ice cold beer. Not have one for a week. <laughs> You know, you're just, oh man, that just, you, you can't wait for that cold, frosty glass and just that, mm, oh man, it's like liquid bread. It's like sunshine in a glass. Yoo -hoo, you know what I mean? Nothing will get that enthusiasm going again than a brief, controlled uh, moratorium, you could call it. A moratorium on what you're wanting. And in this case, it's doing RPG work. Now, this does not have to be going on a year-long sabbatical in Tibet. This can literally be one day or even a couple days of just not looking at material related to RPGs. Just don't look at any of the material. Matter of fact, don't let yourself look at like Instagram or cool posts of people's Lego builds or funny D&D t-shirt memes. Try to just basically do a detox on everything involving the, uh, the RPG hobby. You're going cold turkey. You don't even get a little, just a little, just a little taste. You don't even get that. Even for a couple days, I think you'll be amazed how quickly this can be effective. It does not take, you know, a big gap in your play life or your creativity life to be this person. You will become this person quite quickly. And this is one of the weirdest, creepiest drawings I have ever done. <laughs> so this is you and this is also you. And that's it. Those are the five techniques. So in review, we've got going cold turkey, stepping away. We've got diagnosing, figuring out patterns that might be creating this problem in your life, like different aspects that you need to find and change or eliminate. Then you've got the old fill and soak technique. Soak in a bunch of, or take in a bunch of cool ideas, fill up your brain, then close the book and walk away. And just like cold turkey, you'd be amazed how quickly this can be effective. Then we got make a big old mess here. I have this bizarro creature and talk about fix versus create. Like I can't just leave this sitting here. It's just too weird looking. 
I'm going to put a little toothy mouth on here. Again, Cyclops theme. <laughs> I'm going to add some wispy hairs. And like human hands for feet. Okay, and that brings us to our final one, which is fix versus create, right? So this is the art of remembering that repairing things is always going to be easier than just raw creation. And so you use it as a warm-up exercise or as a something else to do while your creative puzzle is not getting answered. Now, if you go with thinking out there in general on this topic, you're going to find some new stuff too. Here we go. Whoa! <laughs> Some of the thinking out there on this topic includes, let's see, I think it's called reframing the problem is a pretty popular one, which is often like inverting your problem or asking what would my problem look like if I were Winston Churchill? That's one of the most famous ones. It's also called a creative whack or a kick in the head. Um, a kick in the head is basically where you introduce almost complete nonsense into your problem or your challenge and it kind of like knocks some, some marbles loose and you go, oh, well, if Winston Churchill was doing this, he would totally do 3D6 mechanics for this. <laughs> I don't know. I wish Winston Churchill had designed an RPG. But that's a really famous one, reframing the problem. Um, another one is like, you know, confidant or creative, creative confidant. So use another person. Bounce things off another person. See what weird new directions they take things, and that can help break. But really, those five are the ones that I see as the most valuable. And so that's when I'm like, I'm going to lock this down. I know that some of this may sound like something I've already mentioned before, or maybe it's something that you've heard before on the internet. Maybe like Tony Robbins already hit you with some of this. But that's kind of what's funny about these really tough and sincere questions about creative blockage is that people are really deeply frustrated and looking for answers on this stuff. And like there's this bit of a light bulb moment where the answers are quite obvious. They are quite simple and common sensey. But coming from someone else, in this case me, they can feel like outside knowledge coming in, like going, oh yeah, okay, okay, yeah. And that can be that creative kick in the head that knocks the marbles loose. But really the art of breaking creative block is just based on common sense. You, you can't draw blood from a stone, right? That's a famous old saying. And this means that no matter how you might pound and squeeze and, and scream at the sky and grind your teeth, sometimes that approach is not going to get you anywhere. You either need to come at it from a new direction or take a freaking break. That's like infinite common wisdom, right? Common knowledge, common sense. And it applies here too. So I hope that these techniques help. I hope that like YouTube and the overall access we have to all this different inf information and media, and movies and all this stuff nowadays is a help when you're creatively blocked. I know that sometimes for me, reading or maybe catching some new movie or series or something I haven't seen yet can get me churning again. Um, I mentioned Nausicaa quite often, but almost every time I watch that movie, it completely ignites me with ideas and excitement about adventurers with like a cool gun that only holds one bullet and this glider thing and these big bug monsters. <laughs> Everything in that just gets my, my little cells popping in my brain and makes me want to go and make my own little version. So that to me is a big part of diagnostics. I know that if I watch or read or look at certain things, it'll get me going again because I've done that work. I've noticed in myself that some things get me going. I've recorded it and if I need it, I go to it. This is all part of taking your creative creativity seriously. Um, what are some common things you find yourself doing from all these tips? Um, which do you go to first? Which do you find? You know what I do the most of is fill and soak. Fill and soak is absolutely my go-to method when I'm, and you know, you guys got to realize I get creatively stumped multiple times per day, per day, <laughs> not per year, per day. Like I'm working on Hecun Carapace right now. And I'm just like, 
is this even a cool idea? I don't know. So what I'll do is I'll look around. Someone great on Twitter posted this cool picture of a cicada, and that sent me down this weird rabbit hole of looking at like very large insects on the internet. And then I was like, I don't know, I don't know this whole idea is kind of lame. And I just walked off and went and did some house chores, you know, and then I was like, you know, getting some mail and like going through my sort of more, you know, IRL type stuff. About a half an hour later, I'm like, yeah, those big bugs are really neat. I'm gonna go back. And then I look at my art and I'm like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And I write down, I've got a couple of pages of the adventure done, just like that. Just like that. It's not rocket science. It's just not choking the life out of it <laughs> because you will find you choking the light out of, out of yourself. Blah, 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 blah. So which ones don't work for me personally? I've never really liked the reframing method. Uh, you know, in this example, the one I gave, it's a very famous one. Um, unfortunately, I can't give the credit on who sort of coined this, but you know, how would Winston Churchill solve your creative problem? You ask yourself this, and then trying to answer such a strange question kicks you in the head. For me, this has never worked. You know, doing like, you know, reversing things to look at them upside down to spot flaws is, is a similar one. You reframe how you're looking at your problem. This to me is has never really worked because what I often need is to just breathe for a second. I just need to step away, especially if you're doing it day in, day out, like just taking a break. You know, I think uh, there's a statistic that came out about office work um, that actually in an eight hour office work day, people work about three hours because what they're doing is breathing so they can get more stuff done and then breathing and taking a break so they can get some stuff done. Like you guys have all heard the, I've got to go get my stuff done. That whole meme routine about, you know, I need my notebook and my coffee and I need to get my sweater and I need to get my comfy chair and I, so I can get my stuff done. But before I get my coffee, I need to get a Danish and then I also need to pick up my friend and I need to get my phone charged so I can get my stuff done. You know, this whole kind of joke. But to me, nothing beats just rest. Just a little bit of brain rest. Take your eyes off your troubles. Come back. You don't even have to be all refreshed and chipper and whoop de doo you know, chipmunks in the sunrise. It doesn't have to be that crazy. It can just be a brief reprieve. Um, how would the Grinch solve this problem? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Pyra and I, we have talked about the bucket technique. So thanks for the question. Um, especially Tim Carney over at Absolute Tabletop is a real believer in the use of buckets. So if you're creatively blocked on one bucket, which is maybe your cyberpunk setting you're working on, then you switch gears and you go and you work on your, you know, I don't know, animal mutants, mutants down under type game that you're working on. It's completely different, uses a whole different set of creative tools. For me, if I'm kind of, stopped up yeah I'll move to another bucket and stuff but if I'm really creatively blocked we're not talking about like gentle blockage here we're talking about just like man I'm not feeling it no no other bucket is going to work for me I just need to go to yard work or I need to walk around the block or you know brush the dogs <laughs> something completely unrelated um, for me that's the one that works in the most often um, yeah Nausicaa is the movie that I'm referencing yes 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 um, yeah good so why does Hankerin have new glasses? I had an incident about three weeks ago. I was up hiking in the Alpine Lakes wilderness. My prosthetic leg broke. The huge titanium down tube. I don't even know how this is possible. Thing snapped in half. I went down like a ton of bricks. And when I hit, my glasses flew off onto the rocks and I kind of rolled over right onto them and smashed them. <laughs> so I finally got my replacement spectacles. I'm straight librarian mode and I'm loving them. Um, Hey, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. Thanks for the tip. And you know, part of why I did today too is I've been getting such nice messages from everybody. Thank you for all of all of you who do that. You all know who you are. I don't need to list your names. Thank you for these really nice emails that talk about getting back into the into the creative lifestyle, getting back into the hobby, or rediscovering playing D and D, playing RPGs with friends and family. It just means the world to me that I'm making some kind of tiny difference out there. That. There's some kind of droplet of happiness. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's it. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Easy to practice, easy to do. Really, the key step is to take your creativity seriously, to see it as something you want to get better at, and to just accept that if, if I take it seriously and I think through it and I use methods, I record my results, 
I will improve. You may not solve all your problems. Matter of fact, you probably won't, but you will improve. And if you just keep just one foot in front of the other, journey of 10,000 miles starts with a single step, right? That kind of stuff. One after the next, sand the floor, wax the car, right? Just keep going. And before you know it, you'll be looking back, you know karate, and you'll be like, oh wow, how did I even get here? That's the mindset that I like to be in as a creative person, and I would like to invite you guys to do it the same way. Okay, next video is gonna be layout. So I've got a few pieces of art, a little bit of writing done on Hakun Carapace. We're going to get into InDesign. I'm gonna throw you a link for my adventure template if you guys wanna use that and show you how to use templates and rehack your own work into new work, how I do it, and some overall guidelines of what can make layouts look good, which I am definitely not the expert on. There are some really good ones out there, but we're gonna talk about those examples too. That's gonna be in the next RPG Underground video. Thanks you guys for tuning in. Just a nice quick one. How can you explain how's a bucket different from just work on whatever is fun? I think you said no to do. That's the same thing. Buckets are working on whatever is fun. Do it. I'm just saying a real creative block. We're, we're talking about like a real like, man, I'm just not, I got nothing. No, I don't think that a lot of different buckets are going to help if you just are not having creative ignition happening. That it, it really can stop you. If you, if anybody, any of you have ever really been through this, it is. It's really not fun. It's quite unpleasant. It's like the whole endeavor just feels stale to you, and it just nothing's happening. You look within, and there's just nothing there, and it's tough. And I'll tell you, it's really tough in the professional environment because you're expected to deliver on the daily, on the in and on the out, and on a regular basis. And you're going to be creative every freaking day when you walk into this weirdly lit cubicle environment that's when it gets really tough so any of you guys are out there in the professional creative space you really know what i'm talking about it can be very difficult deadlines wait for no one um random suggestion on a video um oh when one of you yeah yeah great 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 recently started watching hey hey welcome man thanks appreciate that okay so anyways thanks you guys for tuning in we're still just diving through this rpg underground concept which is the fundamental essence of the RPG hobby is making things, not necessarily buying them. And so how do you make your things a little bit better? How do you get into the groove of it? What are the mental techniques and skills that are gonna make you slowly improve? If you're like me, you improve very slowly. <laughs> slowly improve at doing the skills of creating and possibly even publishing and distributing your own work, because that's the coolest work. Your story is always the coolest one because you and your players created it so keep it real do not steal and you will always get a deal the bodies must never be found it is by will and will alone i set my mind in motion i'll see you guys on the next video thanks for tuning in and uh have a good weekend okay i'm gonna go over to the thing thanks everybody hey holler back what's up italy <laughs> i don't do deadlines no i think deadlines are crazy deadlines are Deadlines are for crazy people. There shall be no wine before it's time. That's where I'm at. Peace out, guys. Whoa. <laughs>